Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello students, welcome to Swayam Prabha. I am Professor Vageshwari Deswal, a professor at Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. We are discussing the course on Substantive Criminal Law. Today, we will discuss Lesson 3 which is titled Punishments. So, when we talk about punishments, what is the objective of criminal law? That is to punish the wrongdoer. No doubt there has been a shift in the perception recently after we have renamed and amended our old Indian Penal Code to suit the ethos of our country and now we have renamed it as Bharatiya Nyay Sahita. So now the objective of criminal law is not merely to punish the offender but also to provide some sort of a validation to the victim, provide some sort of a relief to the victim also. So let us discuss what is the objective of criminal law. Essentially it is to punish the wrongdoer and what is the basis? Why do we punish the offender or what are the various ideologies or various theories behind this concept of punishment. So, the objective of criminal justice system is to protect the people from wrongful acts of criminals and punish the wrongdoers for their actions which disturb the peace and security of social community. Different theorists philosophers, criminologists, sociologists, judges, penologists and psychologists have laid down different objectives of punishment. So, the five most significant theories of punishment are as follows. The first theory is deterrent theory. As per the proponents of this theory, the objective of punishment is to deter. To set an example, that is why what they advocate is awarding of such harsh punishments such as death penalty so as to set an example for other like-minded people, for other people who might be wanting to take to a life of crime. So by awarding such exemplary, such severe punishments, what are we doing? We are setting an example so as to create a scare in the minds of other uh, potential criminals so that they don't commit crimes. So as per them, the objective is to create a scare. The punishment should be awarded in such a manner such as publicly flogging, publicly hanging so that it sets an example and other people also fall in line and they do not commit crimes. The next theory of crime is retributive theory. So as per this theory of punishment, the objective of punishment is retribution. Retribution means revenge. See, as per the proponents of this theory, they believe that there should be an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So, the way the person commits a crime should be punished in the same manner. If he has caused an injury which resulted in the amputation of an arm or a leg of the victim, so the proponents of this theory, they advocate that the accused should also be punished in a similar manner. His arm needs to be severed or his leg needs to be chopped off too. But then there are people who criticize this kind of an extreme approach towards punishment and what they say is that an eye for an eye will leave the whole world blind. So that is why retribution is not something which can be uh, advocated or which can be promoted in modern day progressive democratic societies. 
No, because we are welfare states and welfareism is the emerging concept nowadays. So what we are supposed to do is take care of our people. Even if they are criminals, we need to try and reform them. Then there is another theory of punishment which is the preventive theory. The proponents of this theory, they believe that prevention is better than cure. So what they say is that Maybe we need to round up all criminal minded people and we need to remove them from places where there are lots of people. So we need to put them behind bars or we need to remove them from cities and leave them in jungles or maybe such places so that they do not get the opportunity to commit crimes. So these people, what they advocate is that externment, banishment. So these are the things that we resort, we should resort to. They also advocate preventive detention laws. What they believe is that when you don't allow a criminal to commit a crime, maybe that would be the best thing because we know that this is a person with criminal tendencies or with a criminal record. So it is the best to stop him in his tracks before he gets an opportunity to commit a crime. But then again, there is a possibility that one with a criminal record might be willing to reform oneself, might not be uh, the one who would be going back to his criminal ways. So if you have to just uh, label a person an offender and then keep on punishing that person because he committed a crime once, that is not something which can be advocated in contemporary times. Then coming to reformative theory. What this means is that we need to reform every individual. See, no one is born a criminal. It is circumstances which make a person a criminal. So everybody deserves another chance. We are children of Gandhiji. Hate the sin, not the sinner. So that is why, that is the ideology which our criminal justice system follows and with the lone exception of death penalty that we award in the rarest of rare cases which serves as a deterrence, by and large what we follow is the reformative approach. Our prisons, they advocate holistic living for criminals in which we try and teach them life skills so as to prevent recidivism. We try to impart uh, such skills such as carpentry or maybe soap making, shoe making and such things which enable them to start their lives afresh once they are out of the prisons. In addition to that, we also focus on meditation, yoga and all this which can make them uh, calm down, which can help them to look within and realize the faults that they have done so that they don't turn back to the way of crime. So reformative approach is by and large the most successful theory of punishment which has been accepted by most of the progressive countries across the world. The next theory of punishment is expiation. That is, when you punish an offender, you have to not merely punish him for the crime that he has committed, but the person should also be given an opportunity to cleanse his soul. By performing penance for what he has done, we should allow the person an opportunity to reform himself, to repent for what the person has done. And that is why when we talk about the new Bharatiya Nyay Sahita, we have introduced the concept of community service so that a person gets an opportunity to reform and expiate for the wrongs that were committed by that person. So by and large, there is no single theory which is accepted by any country. We all go by a mix and match of these various theories, the various objectives of punishments and then we make our own penal system so as to suit the needs of any particular country. Then introduction to punishments under the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita of 2023. See, punishment is a means to secure compliance with the established laws of any country. Punishments are imposed with an objective of prevention of offenses and the other objective is protection of 
society because when a crime is committed it creates an alarm and scare in the society so it is the objective of the state to protect its people from any kind of offense that might be committed against their person or against their property and that is why the state lays down standards of established conduct that is this is how a person is supposed to behave this is what a person can do and this is what a person has to abstain from doing this is criminal behavior this is acceptable conduct this is unacceptable conduct and everybody is supposed to abide by those rules why is that done so that we can pro prevent the commission of any offenses and then we can protect the people of our society modern penology it provides for punishment of criminals by affixing their criminal liability and by imposing sentences how are those sentences decided on the basis of gravity of offenses killing a person highest punishment causing grievous hurt high punishment causing simple hurt a lesser punishment causing theft of a very little amount may be an even lesser punishment so the objective of punishment is to punish the offender appropriately and how is that done by affixing criminal liability and imposition of sentences sentences on the basis of the gravity of the crime committed but then again see law is being applied to people people change there is a tendency to change there are some people who are not willing to change there are some people who are willing to reform then there are different reasons why a person has committed a crime say a person who likes to steal a person who has this thrill of stealing there is a person so who commits lots of thefts he just enjoys living the high quality life and how does he get the money to fulfill his needs by stealing on the other hand there might be a poor person who is dying of starvation so that person steals a loaf of bread now both the acts are acts of stealing but punishment for one cannot be the same as punishment for the other person depending upon the gravity of offense punishment has been prescribed but then who gives those punishment who awards those punishments is a judge who decides the cases on the basis of facts and circumstances of each and every case and then the sentence or the punishment which has been prescribed by the legislators that sentence can be tweaked so as to suit the contingencies or the exigencies of any particular case so depending on that the judge will decide what kind of punishment and what would be the extent of punishment within the parameters as prescribed by the legislators and then that punishment is to be awarded to the offender like in the example that i gave a criminal who steals for the thrill of it is to be awarded the maximum punishment of theft prescribed by the legislators whereas the other person maybe we can award a lesser punishment a token punishment to that person then offenses which are of a severe nature they attract higher punishment than offenses which are of a lighter nature in bhartiya nyay sanhita there is chapter 2 which is totally dedicated to punishments it consists of sections 4 to section 13 and all these sections they deal with the different kinds of punishments that have been prescribed under the bhartiya nyay sanhita so it explains the nature of different kinds of punishments awarded under various provisions of the bharatiya nyay sanhita how punishments are to be enhanced or commuted and how fractions of terms of punishments are to be calculated what does section 4 lay down it lays down the various kinds of punishments to which offenders are liable under the provisions of bns and what are these various kinds of punishments the highest is death penalty second is imprisonment for life death penalty in india that is to be executed by hanging till death and imprisonment for life what does that mean imprisonment for the remainder of a person's natural life then imprisonment 
imprisonment which is of two descriptions namely one rigorous rigorous imprisonment is with hard labor second is simple imprisonment then the other kind of punishment is for feature of property then coming to fine and finally community service which is a new kind of punishment which has been introduced by the bharatiya nyay sanhita in the year 2023 coming to death penalty so death or capital punishment is the highest penalty that is awardable to an accused under the bharatiya nyay sanhita in india death penalty is executed by hanging till death see courts have been granted a great deal of discretion in the award of death penalty and death is not to be awarded except in extremely severe cases where murders have been committed in cold blooded preplanned or a barbaric fashion allowing criminals guilty of having committed intentional cold blooded deliberate and brutal murders to escape with a lesser punishment will deprive the law of its effectiveness and this will result in a travesty of justice that is the reason why we have retained death penalty confirmation of death penalty by the high court is another prerequisite for award of death sentence so death sentence even if it is awarded by a district judge it has to be necessarily confirmed by a high court and only after that can it be executed sections 407 to section 412 of the bharatiya nagrik suraksha sanhita lay down rules for submission of death sentences for confirmation sections 453 to section 456 of the bharatiya nagrik suraksha sanhita lay down provisions in respect of execution suspension postponement remission and commutation of death sentences now we will discuss provisions relating to execution suspension remission and commutation of sentences in detail so how is an order passed under section 409 to be executed for that we have a provision under the bharatiya nagrik suraksha sanhita section 453 what it says is when in a case submitted to the high court for confirmation of a sentence of death the court of session receives the order of confirmation or other order of the high court thereon it shall cause such order to be carried into effect by issuing a warrant or taking such other steps as may be necessary so you see the court of session will receive an order of confirmation from the high court what this implies is that confirmation should come from the high court and it is only after that that the death penalty which has been awarded to a person and duly confirmed by the high court can it be executed thereafter then execution of sentence that has been passed by the high court so the provision section 454 of the bharatiya nagrik suraksha sanhita lays down that when a sentence of death is passed by the high court in appeal or in revision the court of session shall on receiving the order of the high court cause the sentence to be carried into effect by issuing a warrant then provision regarding postponement of execution of sentence of death in case of appeal to supreme court say the high court has confirmed the death penalty and the accused he moves the supreme court he challenges the decision of the high court then what is to be done so under section 455 of the bharatiya nagrik suraksha sanhita 
where a person is sentenced to death by the high court and an appeal from its judgment lies to the Supreme Court under sub clause A or sub clause B of clause 1 of article 134 of the constitution, the high court shall order the execution of sentence to be postponed until the period allowed for preferring such appeal has expired or if an appeal is preferred within that period until such appeal is disposed of. So, till the time the appeal is pending, the execution will be stayed. Then, where a sentence of death is passed or confirmed by the High Court and the person sentenced makes an application to the High Court for the grant of a certificate under Article 132 or under sub clause C of clause 1 of Article 134 of the Constitution, the High Court shall order the execution of the sentence to be postponed until such application is disposed of by the High Court or if a certificate is granted on such application until the period allowed for preferring an appeal to the Supreme Court on such certificate has expired. So, you see how many checks we have in place before a person is to be executed. This is because life once lost, we cannot get it back. So, that is why we have to be doubly sure before executing any person. See a person who is condemned to death penalty by a court of competent jurisdiction. So, there are multiple steps after that also. The death sentence, it has to be confirmed by the high court. Beyond that, if the accused moves in appeal, we will move for the decision of the higher court. And it is only when he has exhausted all possible remedies, if he moves for mercy petition also, we have to wait till we get a final decision. And only after that can death penalty be executed. So, where a sentence of death is passed or confirmed by the high court and the high court is satisfied that the person sentenced intends to present a petition to the Supreme Court for the grant of special leave to appeal under article 136 of the constitution, the high court shall order the execution of sentence to be postponed for such period as it considers sufficient to enable him to present such petition. Now a very important point and that is what if death penalty is awarded to a woman while she is pregnant. See the crime has been committed by that woman but what about the innocent life that is growing inside that woman. Now that child, that unborn child has a right to be born alive. So what to do in such cases? So section 456 of the Bharatiya Nagarik Suraksha Sahita lays down provisions relating to commutation of sentence of death on a pregnant woman. So what does the law say? If a woman sentenced to death is found to be pregnant, the high court shall commute the sentence to imprisonment for life. Now what is the difference between death and life imprisonment? Prior to the Criminal Procedure Amendment Act of 1955, in our country, death penalty was the rule and life imprisonment an exception in capital offences as per the provisions of the old CRPC. Now the old CRPC, the old IPC, they were both archaic in nature. Why? Because they were enacted by our colonial masters. So for them, human life of their slaves was not of that much importance as we would like it to be. So that is why for them, once they had prescribed death penalty for a crime, if they had declared that, okay, this is an offense for which a person is to be awarded a death penalty, then it was the rule and judges, they could not exercise much of a discretion. They had to award a death penalty and in case they chose not to do so, then they would have to record reasons. 
In such cases, death penalty was the rule and it was only in exceptional cases that they could choose to award life imprisonment instead of death penalty. And the courts, they were additionally bound to give explanation. That is why they chose to award a lesser sentence of life imprisonment instead of death penalty that has been prescribed by the law. After the amendment of 1955, after we had gained our independence also, so we amended our criminal laws in 1955 and now courts, they had a liberty. Now they could decide whether death penalty was required for any particular offense or whether life imprisonment would suffice in that particular case. Then, as per section 354 clause 3, of the Criminal Procedure Code in 1973, the situation was reversed and life sentence became the rule and death penalty an exception in criminal offences. See, because ours is a state committed to the welfare of its people. So, even where a person was committing a crime which entitled him to death penalty, we would always give a chance to that person that let us sentence this person to life imprisonment and not award a death penalty and death penalty could be awarded only in rarest of rare cases. So now earlier the rule was death penalty the rule and life imprisonment the exception. In 1973 when we overhauled our criminal procedure code we changed it and now it was that life imprisonment was the rule in capital offences and death penalty would be awarded only in exceptional cases. Further, the courts were required to state reasons in writing for awarding the maximum penalty. That is, if they chose to disregard the rule of life imprisonment and they chose to award death penalty instead. Now, the onus was on the courts to explain that what were the aggravating factors that made them arrive at that decision, why they chose to overlook life imprisonment and award death penalty. Now, this is a situation even now and it remains unchanged even after we have replaced the old IPC and CRPC with Bharatiya Nyay Sahita and Bharatiya Nagarik Suraksha Sahita respectively. IPC has been replaced by BNS, CRPC has been replaced by the BNSS. So, what are the offences for which death penalty may be awarded under the Indian Criminal Substantive Law, which is the BNS of 2023. So, the offences have been listed herein, as you can see on the screen. What are those offences? 1. Punishment for rape that causes death or results in persistent vegetative state of victim under section 66, because this is a very, very serious nature of crime in which the victim is left for dead and the victim is in a nearly dead state by being in a persistent vegetative state. So, in such cases, the accused can be awarded even the death penalty. Next is gang rape, that is when more than one person, they have jointly in furtherance of common intention or, a, or acting as a group, when they have committed rape on a woman, so they can be punished with the highest penalty of death penalty. Punishment for re repeat offenders guilty of rape. So, repeatedly committing rapes, repeatedly committing such heinous crimes. So, these are people who can be awarded the highest penalty. Committing murder, deliberate, cold-blooded, intentional murders. Now, what they deserve is highest penalty. Punishment for murder by life convict. See, earlier this was struck down in Mithu versus state of Punjab because they said that if one who was already undergoing a life imprisonment and that person commits murder, so it would amount to a mandatory death penalty. But now it has been reworded. So it is not mandatory even now, but in such cases there is obviously a provision that if the court feels that again awarding him a life sentence would not suffice, then in such cases if required such an accused can be convicted with death penalty also. Then abetment of suicide of a minor, insane or intoxicated person. 
So if you are abetting a person to commit suicide and the victim is either one who is a minor, incapable of understanding the nature or consequences of their actions or if you are causing a person of unsound mind, one who doesn't know what that person is doing to take away his or her own life or similarly one who is in an inebriated condition, one who is intoxicated either by drugs or liquor or anything and you cause such a person to commit an act which leads that person to lose his life. That is if you are abetting suicide of one who is a minor, one who is of unsound mind or one who is intoxicated, then in such cases when you are taking advantage of the vulnerabilities of any person, so that is again a crime of the highest order for which nothing but only the death penalty will suffice. Then in cases of attempt to murder by a person under sentence of imprisonment for life if hurt is caused. See there is a person already undergoing a life imprisonment and then what that person does is he commits to, he attempts to commit murder of another person while he is already undergoing that sentence. Then in such cases if hurt has been caused there is the option for death penalty. Terrorist acts. Terrorist acts are something which cannot be condoned no matter what. So in such cases we have the provision for highest penalty. Then kidnapping or abducting in order to murder or for ransom, okay, someone kidnapping a person, abducting a person for money or for killing that person, again death penalty. Then waging or attempting to wage war or abetting waging of war against the government of India. It is again a very, very serious crime for which death penalty can be awarded. Abetting mutiny and the mutiny actually committed. Again, punishable with up to death penalty. Giving or fabricating false evidence upon which an innocent person suffers death. See, a person, you know that the person is innocent and the person is being wrongly framed and still you choose to give a false evidence against such a person which causes the person to suffer death, to be awarded death penalty. So giving of false evidence in such cases is again a very, very serious, severe and a reprehensible crime for which death penalty can be awarded. Then decoity accompanied with murder. Decoity in itself, see for more than five people armed with deadly weapons committing such an offense, that in itself is a very serious crime. And then if while committing decoity, murder has also been committed, again this is a fit case for award of death penalty. So these are all instances in which death penalty may be awarded. See we do not talk about mandatory death penalty. This is where death penalty may be awarded and then there is a judicial officer who is looking into the peculiar facts and circumstances of each and every case, looking into the aggravating and mitigating factors and then finally taking a call whether the accused is to be sentenced to death penalty or not. Now there is a debate on the constitutional validity of death penalty. Death has been abolished as a form of punishment in most of the developed countries. Criminologists and sociologists have for long been demanding abolition of death penalty in our country also. But a proposal for the same was rejected by the Law Commission in its 34th report. The constitutionality of death penalty was challenged before the Supreme Court in the case of Jagmohan Singh versus State of UP on the following grounds. What are those grounds? 1. Death sentence puts an end to all fundamental rights guaranteed under clauses A to G of sub clause 2 of article 19 of the constitution. And therefore, the law with regard to capital sentence is unreasonable and it is not in the interest of the general public. Second argument is the discretion invested in the judges to impose capital punishment is not based on any standards of policy required by the legislature for imposing capital punishment in preference to imprisonment for life. Third argument, the uncontrolled and unguided discretion in the judges to impose capital punishment or imprisonment for life is hit by article 14 of the 
constitution see article 14 talks about equality and if when you are giving discretion in the judges so for them they may choose to award death penalty to one person and life imprisonment to other so what they are saying is that unless and until the discretion which is to be exercised is by the judges is guided by certain sound principles till that time such a discretion could be arbitrary and it could be violative of article 14. Then the next argument the provisions of the law they do not provide a procedure for trial of factors and circumstances crucial for making the choice between capital penalty and imprisonment for life and therefore it violates article 21. So, these were the arguments that were put forth against capital pun punishment but the Supreme Court dismissed the appeal and what did the Supreme Court hold? Article 72 sub clause 1 sub clause C and article 134 of the constitution and entries 1 and 2 in list 3 of the 7th schedule to the constitution show that the constitution makers had recognized death sentence as a permissible punishment and they had made constitutional provisions for appeal, reprieve and the like. Next, according to article 21, deprivation of life is constitutionally permissible if that is done according to procedure established by law. Thus, the death sentence imposed after trial in accordance with legally established procedures under CRPC and the Indian Evidence Act is not unconstitutional under Article 21. What did the Supreme Court next observe? In India, the onerous duty of passing the death sentence is cast on judges. And for more than a century, judges have been carrying out this duty under the Indian Penal Code. The impossibility of laying down standards is at the very core of the criminal law as administered in India, which invests the judges with a very wide discretion in the matter of fixing the degree of punishment. That discretion in the matter of sentence is liable to be corrected by superior courts. The exercise of judicial discretion on well recognized principles is in the final analysis the safest possible safeguard for an accused person. The Supreme Court further observed crime as crime may appear to be superficially the same but the facts and circumstances of a crime are widely different and since a decision of the court as regards punishment is dependent upon a consideration of all the facts and circumstances there is hardly any ground for a challenge under article 14 so it is differently placed people who are treated differently then next the court held in the context of our criminal law which punishes murder one cannot ignore the fact that life imprisonment works out in the most cases to a dozen years of imprisonment and it may be seriously questioned whether that sole alternative will be an adequate substitute for death penalty. Proposals for abolition of death penalty have not been accepted by parliament. In this state of affairs, it cannot be said that capital punishment as such is either unreasonable or not in public interest. There was another leading judgment, Rajendra Prasad versus state of Uttar Pradesh. In this case also, while addressing the issue of judicial discretion, in the award of death penalty, the court held that since law reflects life, new meanings must permeate the penal code. Deprivation of life under our system is too fundamental to be permitted except on the gravest ground 
and under the strictest scrutiny. At the same time, the social justice which the preamble and part 4 specifically article 38 highlight as paramount in the governance of the country has a role to mold the sentence. If the murderous operation of a die hard criminal jeopardizes social security in a persistent planned and perilous fashion then his enjoyment of fundamental rights may be rightly annihilated. Thus, there is a need to read sections 302 of the IPC and section 354 clause 3 in the humane light of part 3 and part 4 further illuminated by the preamble of the constitution. In the same case, while further laying down guidelines for the judicious exercise of discretion by the courts, it was emphasized that the special reasons that are stated by the courts while awarding death penalty must pertain to the criminal also and not to the crime alone. There was another judgment, Bachchan Singh versus State of Punjab, in which the court held the constitutional validity of death penalty for murder provided in section 302 and the sentencing procedure embodied in subsection 3 of section 354 of CRPC was referred for consideration to a constitution bench of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of the aforesaid provisions and propounded the rarest of rare cases doctrine. Now, this dictum is a landmark doctrine according to which death penalty is not to be awarded except in the rarest of rare cases when the alternative option is unquestionably foreclosed. So, now what does this mean is that again it is to be life sentence that is to be ordinarily awarded and death penalty is not to be awarded except in the rarest of rare cases. So, while deciding what is a rarest of rare cases. What is to be kept in mind by the courts? There is an inventory of aggravating and mitigating circumstances. If there are more aggravating factors, they would necessarily point towards awarding of death penalty. But if there are more mitigating factors, there are factors which mitigate the guilt of the accused persons, then maybe we can be slightly lenient towards the accused persons. So, what can be those aggravating and mitigating factors? Let us talk about them. First, let us talk about the aggravating factors. See, if an accused has committed a murder under any of the aggravating circumstances, it would obviously make out a case for awarding the higher penalty. What would be the factors? If the murder has been committed after previous planning and involves extreme brutality, if the murder involves exceptional depravity, if the murder is of a member of any of the armed forces of the union or of a member of any police force or of any public servant and was committed while such member or public servant was on duty or in consequence of anything done or attempted to be done by such member or public servant in the lawful discharge of his duty as such member or public servant whether at the time of murder he was such member or public servant as the case may be or had ceased to be such member or public servant or if the murder is of a person who had acted in the lawful discharge of his duty under section 43 of the CRPC or who had rendered assistance to a magistrate or a police officer demanding his aid or requiring his assistance under section 37 and section 129 of the said code. Then in such cases the accused is fit to be awarded the highest penalty of law. But suppose there is a case in which there are certain mitigating factors, certain factors which point to a direction in which we might be lenient with the accused. Now, let us see what those mitigating factors can be. That the offence was committed 
under the influence of extreme mental or emotional disturbance. So, there were had so the accused had a reason, the accused was mentally disturbed, emotionally disturbed, which impaired his decision or judgment taking abilities due to which he ended up committing such a crime. So, that could be a mitigating factor. Then, the age of the accused, if the accused is too young, too old, then in such cases we do not ordinarily award the sentence of death. If there is the probability that the accused would not commit criminal acts of violence as would constitute a continuing threat to society. So, if it can be proven that he was just a one off offender and this is no likelihood of the accused returning to way of crime or a life of crime, then in such cases also we can take a lenient view. The probability that the accused can be reformed and rehabilitated. The state shall by evidence prove that the accused does not satisfy the conditions 3 and 4 above if the state has to make out a case for death penalty. If the state cannot prove that this person is beyond reform or that he will take back to way of crime, then in such cases death penalty would be awarded. But if it can be proven or if can be established by the defense that no, this person has no intentions of going back to crime and he can be reformed, there is a possibility of reform, then in such cases death penalty would not be awarded. So, the burden would be on the prosecution, on the state to prove that this person cannot be reformed Then it is only then that we can think of awarding death penalty. Then the next mitigating factor would be that in the facts and circumstances of the case, the accused believed that he was morally justified in committing the offence. See morality is a diffuse concept and there is a lot of subjectivity when it comes to morality. So, it is to be judged on the basis of facts and circumstances of each and every case whether this standard of morality can be applied. Then other mitigating factor could be that the accused acted under the duress or domination of another person or that the condition of accused showed that he was mentally defective and the said defect impaired his capacity to appreciate the criminality of his conduct. It was owing to that mental defect that the person could not understand that what he was doing was a criminal act. So, in such cases the person would be entitled to some sort of a lenient treatment. Then there is another very landmark judgment, Machi Singh versus State of Punjab, wherein while dealing with the question as to what are the rarest of rare cases, the Supreme Court laid down the following considerations for determining whether a case falls under the category of rarest of rare cases or not. The first factor would be manner of commission of murder. So, when the murder is committed in an extremely brutal, grotesque, diabolical, revolting or dastardly manner so as to arouse intense and extreme indignation of the community, then in such cases it would fall under the rarest of rare cases. Then what was the commission for motive of murder? When the murder is committed for a motive which evinces total depravity and meanness. For example, a hired assassin committing murder for the sake of money or reward or a cold blooded murder committed with a deliberate design in order to inherit property or to gain, con gain control over property of a ward or person under the control of murderer or vis a vis whom the murderer is in a dominating position or in a position of trust or murders that are committed in the course for betrayal of motherland. So, this is a case of exploitation of dependencies, someone dependent on you, you are killing that person, you are killing someone just for money contract killer, a hired assassin. Now, these are extremely depraved persons for whom death penalty would be the only solution. Then coming to the anti-social or socially abhorrent nature of crime. For example, if somebody murders members of the scheduled caste or minority community, 
Now these people they are being targeted just because they belong to a minority community or just below because in the social hierarchy they are considered as a lower caste. So now this is a very socially abhorrent kind of crime to be committed. Similarly, killing a woman for dowry okay, or killing a woman uh, putting her on her husband's pyre to be made a sati. Now these are all socially reprehensible acts burning a woman burning a bride just because she has brought insufficient dowry now these are all socially abhorrent crimes for which death penalty may be awarded so these are fit cases to be covered under the rarest of rare cases then magnitude of crime that's a very important influencing factor in determining whether death penalty should be awarded whether it is a case that falls under the rarest of rare cases or not so when the crime is enormous in proportion, for instance, when multiple murders say of all or almost all the members of a family or a large number of persons of a particular caste, community or locality are committed. So, but the sheer magnitude of crime is revolting to the common conscience of the society and such persons they need to be sent to the gallows. Then what is the personality of victim of murder? See, when the victim of murder is an innocent child who could not have or has not provided even an excuse, much less a provocation for murder. So, why could you kill such an innocent person without any provocation? How could you do that? So, this is an extremely indignifying act, something which falls under the rarest of rare case. If you have killed a helpless woman, or a person who was rendered helpless by being thrown out of the house or by old age or one who is suffering from any kind of a handicap or any kind of an infirmity. So, killing such people, then when the victim is a person vis a vis whom the murderer is in a position of domination or trust or when the victim is a public figure who is generally loved and respected by the community for the services rendered by such a person and the murder is committed for political or similar reasons other than personal reasons. So, all these cases they entitle a person for award of death penalty. Such cases would be covered under the rarest of rare cases. So, what is the test for determining rarest of rare case? Life imprisonment is the rule and death sentence and exception. Death sentence must be imposed only when life imprisonment appears to be an altogether inadequate punishment having regard to the relevant circumstances of the crime. Next, the extreme penalty of death need not be inflicted except in gravest cases of extreme culpability and in determining the same the circumstances of the criminal should be considered along with the circumstances of the crime. That is, we have to apply the test of crime as well as the test of criminal. Then, a balance sheet of aggravating and mitigating circumstances has to be drawn up and in doing so, the mitigating circumstances have to be accorded full weight and a just balance has to be struck between the aggravating and the mitigating circumstances before the option is exercised. If the circumstances of crime are such that there is no alternative but to impose death sentence even after according maximum weightage to the mitigating circumstances, the court should proceed to do so. The court's failure to impose capital punishment for heinous crimes falling in the rarest of rare category would amount to repeal of death penalty by the judiciary. And in our country, abolition is something which can be done only by the legislature. It is not within the jurisdiction of the courts to abolish death penalty. Now, the next kind of punishment that has been prescribed under the law is life imprisonment. So, contrary to popular perception, imprisonment for life amounts to imprisonment 
for the whole or remaining period of the convict's natural life and not only 14 years. <clears throat> Many times people believe that maybe life imprisonment would amount to imprisonment for a term of 14 years. Let me clarify here, life imprisonment means imprisonment for the remainder of a person's natural life and not merely 14 years. So convicts who undergo life imprisonment, they are housed in the central prisons of the concerned states. Life imprisonment is always rigorous. It is never simple. See, because life imprisonment is considered to be a severe punishment. That is why the nature of life imprisonment is not meant to be a simple imprisonment. Life imprisonment was introduced in Indian Penal Code in 1955 as a substitute for transportation for life, which implied banishment for convicts from Indian territories to either the central jail in Andamans or some other British colonies where they were made to do hard labour <coughs> for the rest of their lives. Under section 474 clause B of the BNSS and section 5 of the BNS, the appropriate government has the power to commute a sentence of imprisonment for life to imprisonment for a term which shall not be less than 7 years but still there is a power of commutation with the state. See although convicts cannot as a matter of right claim automatic release after 14 years in practice however life imprisonment means incarceration for 14 years when lifers become entitled to remission of the rest of sentence as per the prison manual provisions and section 6 lays down that in calculating fractions of terms of punishment, imprisonment for life is to be reckoned as equivalent to imprisonment for 20 years unless otherwise provided. So students, in this lesson, we discussed the various kinds of punishments that have been prescribed under the IPC. We discussed death penalty and life imprisonment the remaining kinds of punishments will be discussed in the next lecture. I hope you are clear about whatever has been discussed so far and you will continue in the remaining lessons also to remain with me. So that will be all for this session. I hope you enjoyed this lesson as much as I did. Thank you.